I'm coming at you today with another quilty video. I'm going to talk about some of my favorite notions and tools that I use for quilting. So let's go ahead and get into it. So I've been quilting for probably about two and a half, uh, maybe three years now. So I'm no like expert obviously at quilting. I consider myself a confident beginner, but I have learned in that time that there is an absolute plethora of quilting tools. Now, do you need them all? Absolutely not. There are a few basics that you really need to have in order to quilt. And that's, as long as you have those basics, you can do pretty much everything you need to do. The first thing you really need to have is a cutting mat. Now this is a smaller size. Um, this is good for when I'm just sitting at my machine and I'm sewing over here and I need to turn over here and just tr trim or cut. This is a 12 by 18 size. Now my usual mat that fits this table space that I'm working with is um, much larger. I can't remember the size of it, but it does fit this table. I think it's like 24 by something or or 36 by something it's pretty it's pretty big and um, that's the one I use most of the time if I'm pretty much cutting large pieces of fabric or backing or binding or whatever but this size right here is great to have right next to me my chair sort of swings over here and over here where you can't see it I have my sewing machine and right here I usually have my cutting mat and my other like little tools so I can just swivel my chair back and forth so a cutting mat is essential going along the lines of a cutting mat you need to have a rotary cutter so this is what a rotary tool looks like. It generally has the blade that slides open and slides closed. Now, generally the rule of thumb on these rotary cutters, if it's not in your hand, it stays closed so that you're not cutting yourself accidentally. There's been numerous accidents put all over, you know, qu uh, quilting groups and things where people have accidents with their rotary cutter. So if you open it, you use it, you don't ever set it down without closing it again. If you can get yourself into that habit right away, it's awesome. Especially if you have animals, like I have cats who think that they're supervisors and I don't really want them around my space with an open rotary cutter. So there's your um, safety message of the day. So rotary cutter is very important to have. Um, you also should have a pair of scissors. You never know when they might come in handy. You'll need these for cutting like, you know, the edges of backing or something. You could obviously use a rotary cutter for that, but it is handy to have a pair of scissors. I have two. I have fabric scissors, and then these are my utility all-purpose scissors. So I will never use my fabric scissors to cut paper or anything that isn't fabric. That's what I use my utility scissors for. And I also keep a small pair of uh, snips here for snipping thread if it comes off the sewing machine or trimming thread off of my uh, blocks, but this is just really for um, snipping thread. And everything sort of hangs right over there pretty handy. This is a nifty little tool that I love to have. It is a st uh, stash and stow, I think they call it. Yeah, stash and stow. I can actually have this in my area, so when I'm pulling different things that I might need to use, things will actually stand up in there so that I can have my scissors, I can have another tool that I need so that they're not just all over my table and I don't know where they are. I can have a pencil in here, just little things like that and it keeps them um, off the work surface and right where I know that they are whenever I'm using them. So love to have a little stash in store. Um, I pulled out this little tool, I love this. This is my little um, awl or a stiletto so it's very sharp. It's got a little point here. Um, you can get them that are not quite as sharp. It doesn't really matter what its purpose is, is to help feed the fabric through instead of your finger when you get close to a needle. So if your needle is here on your sewing machine, you can hold the fabric and push the fabric through right through the needle or under the needle by using a stiletto. It lets you get a little bit more precise and hold that fabric right up until the last second. So this is truly a handy tool to have and one of my must-haves. So I really love that. Now you need pins. Um, for me, a must-have is a magnetic pin cushion for a couple of reasons. First of all, if I am um, pushing it around or whatever, it, the pins don't go anywhere. If I should happen to drop pins or on the floor and I can't see them, I can turn this over and just slowly put it over the carpet or the work surface and it picks up all the pins. And also if I have it on the table and I'm sewing, I can pull a pin out and as long as I toss it in the general area, the uh, magnet on the pin cushion will pull it and um, 
they won't go all over so it saves me time when i'm sewing so i can just sew and pull and sew and pull and sew and pull and the pins all stay right here and that being said you need a nice sharp pin i like ones that are slightly flexible but um, are really solid i know that there are a lot of popular brands of pins uh, these little bird ones are my favorite um, I like them because they're nice and fine. I've had them for basically almost three years and they've, they've just done me really, really well. I don't really like a thick pin. I don't like anything that's going to leave holes in my fabric. And I don't want something that's going to add, be so thick it kind of adds to the bulk while I'm trying to stitch it underneath my needle. So I love that. And my last absolute, uh, well, there's probably two more must-haves. Um, where is it? This right here is a must-have in my... Uh, thoughts this is a walking foot now what a walking foot does is it helps you to move the fabric uniformly under your needle when you have uh, layers of fabric so if you have the backing and then you have a piece of batting and then you have the quilt top which also has seams in it which increases the bulk um, the bottom of the feed dogs might not always be able to push the bottom of that fabric through at the same rate as that top fabric and then you're going to get them that really aren't they're shifting and moving and they're not going to be um nice smooth good results but if you have a walking foot it just helps to keep all the layers of the fabric moving together at the same time so you don't have as much of a risk of your fabric shifting on you while you're sewing so to me that is a must have in my sewing arsenal basically so and i said i had one more and for me that would really be my a quilting journal my quilting journal is where I keep track of all the patterns I would like to make so that nothing gets bought and then missed or I don't kit something up and then I never touch it because what's the use of that? Um, I have a small space so I really have space, I really need to use my space well and that means um, storing and buying and keeping what I'm actually going to use. So this is an essential. Oh, and we can't forget about your rulers. Now, there are tons and tons and tons of rulers on the market, all kinds of specialty rulers and specialty sizes. For me, if I was just starting out or when I was just starting out, I basically started out with this ruler. Now, this is your uh, is it six and a half uh, by 24, I think it is. And this will get your long lengths. It's long enough so that it will handle with the fabric folded in half. So a 44 piece of fabric folded in half is 22 inches. So this will cut all of your long strips and your binding. It's also not so wide this way that you can't use this to cut smaller lengths if you needed to, to use that. So this to me is a size that's really a must have. A sort of semi must have, like you could get away without it, but the second ruler I would buy would probably be the six and a half by 12. Maybe even a six and a half by 18 would be fine as well because it's a little more maneuverable. You still have a nice wide piece and yet it's not so long that you could get in there and you could use it for um, smaller lengths if you need like, I don't know, maybe you need a five by eight um, piece of strip or whatever you can do that with this. It's not so long that you're having to maneuver this long ruler on a smaller piece of fabric. So those are the two ones that I would really include in my must-haves. Now outside of your must-haves, we're now going to get into the nice two halves. So with what I've already shown you, you can, you can get in there, jump in, start quilting, and do pretty much everything you need to do. I am lucky that I have a few more extras than I would normally have because I have a friend who um, was downsizing and had just tons of stuff. Plus she had doubles of a lot of things because she also had her RV set up for quilting. And now that they're not RVing anymore, I got to be the recipient of all of her doubles that she used to keep in the RV. So these are what I would call extras. So she had these in her RV trailer and they are some specialty rulers. Now what these are are smaller sizes. So she has some small rectangle rulers and I've used them and they're super handy when you just want to do small little things or you're working with scrap quilts or smaller projects. Not necessary, nice to have. And they come in a particular setup of sizes. You've got one and a half inch length here by, what is it, six and a half. Here's one that's two and a half inches wide if you're working with two and a half inch squares um, or two and a half inch rectangles or just trying to trim up or cut. Some of these are nice to have. I won't tell you all the sizes because it will just take time, but you can see we have 
quite a few different sizes here. And these are her rec were her rectangle set. So when you're working with a little bit longer pieces, she had a similar set that was all squares. So here's your two and a half square, your three and a half square, your four and a half square, your five and a half square, and your six and a half square. So you could use these to um, square up blocks, like if you have a six and a half inch block, or maybe you want to um, make uh, charm squares of your own. You want to do five by five charm squares. You can do that right on here. And the nice thing about these rulers is you'll notice that they're clear, but they have this um, colored edge. It's so that this would be the finished size after it's sewn and this is the size of the piece you want to cut out. It um, sort of accounts for the seam allowance. So it's a half inch extra which be would be a quarter inch seam on all sides. So um, that's kind of nifty. And then I keep them in this little cute little tin here so it doesn't take up too much space and I can sort of slip this right into a bookshelf. And it's also cute enough if I um, wanted to hang it, because it's hangable here, I could do that as well. Isn't that adorable? Now, these are sort of some super extras. Now, you could do this. This is for uh, fussy cutting, or I actually think it's also for squaring up. You could do that with any of these. But these actually um, are where you would use the lines that you see here. There's X's. Let me take one out. I'll take a big one out so you could see. So it's got these X's on here so that you can line them up if you're doing this large like um, half square triangles. You can line that right up with the center seam and then you can trim around the edge and that center seam will always make sure that your block is centered. You also have that if you're doing maybe a four square like a patch um, patchwork type so that you can line these up with the center and the um, middle seam there, the horizontal and vertical seam. And if you have those lined up with the seams, when you trim around the edge, it'll always be a perfect um, six and a half inch square. Is that what this one is? I think so. Six inch square. So this will give you a six inch square, I believe. I think it says somewhere on here. No, it would be six and a half. It wouldn't be a six inch square. So this is a six and a half. So this comes in six and a half, five and a half, four and a half, three and a half, and two and a half. So this is a square up um, ruler. And the advantage of this versus these is these are all grid lines basically designed for cutting. You won't really have that X or that horizontal plus sign that helps you to square up your triangles or your squares or your blocks or whatever. Do you need these? No, you could get away without them. Nice to have because it makes the job a little bit faster. This is all, these things are all about making things a little faster. Saving time, more time to do other things. So I was really fortunate to be able to uh, be the recipient of this little uh, setup here. Another thing that she gave me, which is not necessary, but it does help to save time, are all of her flying geese rulers. These again were also out of her RV. So she has a set already in the house. And in here in this little project bag, I keep all the instructions. She gave me the instructions for all of these and I put them right in here. Now flying geese rulers, are pretty nifty. Let me see if I can put something behind it where you can see how it looks. So they basically, again, you're lining up your seams and you can cut like, or make like an oversized piece and it does help you to line up your seams and then cut a perfect um, flying geese. You've got, a, each one of these has two sizes. There's a size here. And then if you do it this way, there's a second size there. And there's a whole bunch of these quilt in a day um, flying geese rulers and all these different sizes. Do you have to have these? Absolutely not. Um, do they make life easier when you do have them? Absolutely. Again, this is something I was lucky to have. Makes life easy. I love them, but you don't really necessarily need them. So I'm going to put these in my nice to have category. Um, this actually, while I have this out, is something that I made. This is a little portable um, ironing board. It fits in my backpack for when I go to classes and it's kind of handy. It's really lightweight. It's a piece of plywood that I had them cut for me at the hardware store. And then I just covered it with batting. And then this is some Lori Holt decorator weight um, fabric that I put over it. It's like a lightweight canvas. She has a video on making these on her blog. They're awesome. I have them in several sizes. This is the smallest one. Again, it can sit right here. So when I am sewing and I need to put a block right over here, I swivel my chair this way. I go ahead and iron right on here. And then I can turn back to my sewing machine and keep sewing. Super handy to have. And that will sort of um, 
lead into some ironing. I do keep a small iron that I can keep right at my table. This is a little Rowenta travel iron. I absolutely love this iron. It does do steam if you want. Now there is the dry iron camp and there's the steam iron camp. It doesn't matter what side you belong to. The side you belong to is the right side for you. I dry iron. I never put water in my iron and um, my irons last forever. So um, that's one of the reasons why I do that. When I do need to um, add a little moisture to my block, which I do on occasion, I will usually spray it with this little mister and it creates a really fine mist across my fabric so it doesn't drench it. It just mists it. Or sometimes I will also starch. That's another uh, camp they have. There's the starch camp and the no starch camp. And within the starch camp, there's heavy starchers and there's light starchers and all of that. I consider myself something of a lighter starcher. Um, when you starch, it just stiffens your fabric a little bit so that it moves a little bit less. It's easier to um, sew together. You're not getting as much shifting in the threads. And um, a lot of people say, and I would agree with that for myself, that it makes it a lot easier to... Um, to sew and get more accurate uh, blocks that way. Um, that being said, when you're starching, you're also shrinking your fabric. So you need to be aware of that. You're always gonna wanna starch your piece of fabric before you cut. Because if you cut a five inch square and then you spray it with your starch, it's gonna shrink a little and it's no longer going to be a five inch square. So you always wanna starch your fabric before you, um, you cut it. And I'm in a small space, so I was able to find an over the door drying rack it's pretty much meant for clothes, um, but I use it for drying my fabric. It's fabulous. I can um, pull it, um, kind of has like shelves that go down or, or times that go down and you pull them up, hang all your fabric on it. And then when it's dry, I just put them back down flat and I can leave them behind my door until I'm ready to use them. I will insert a picture of that rack, both open and closed. So talking about fabric, once you have um, got your fabric and you know what you're going to do, you're going to decide whether you're a steamer or not a steamer, a starcher or not a starcher. So as I said, I am a light starcher. I like to keep all of my ironing supplies in this cute little tote. It looks like this in the front. It's metal. It has a handle so I can easily carry it wherever I go. And in here I have a towel. I have my water mister. And then I like to use Best Press. It's my favorite type of, um, it's not really a starch, it's a starching alternative and a um, sizing, whatever they say it is. Let me see, I'll show you. Here is my big bottle of Best Press. Mary Ellen's Best Press, the clear starch and sizing alternative. This one is Lavender Fields. They've got lots of different scents. They also have scent free. I love it. And if you do use that, there's also another way to use it. We have the people that dilute it and the people that don't and the people that dilute it also will do like a quarter dilution, a half dilution. So you pretty much have to play around with the um, firmness that you, um, that you like. I actually do mine a quarter. I dilute it by a quarter and keep it in this bottle so it's easy for me to spray. It has the right kind of mist. I don't like a spray that's too um, loose because then you're just spotting all over. I want the mist to be able to saturate um, the fabric that I'm using. And um, I had to go through several of these bottles till I found a bottle that works well. If your cap here is square, it's not going to be the right kind of bottle for starching. You want one that's round so that you have infinite adjustment of the um, misting and the spray that's coming out of there. So here is how I do that. I spray it down and I'm ready to go. Now I don't saturate so that it's dripping, but I do like to get the entire um, piece of fabric nice and wet and that's where my towel comes in. So I have my towel I keep in there and that's so that I don't get this starching uh, alternative all over everything so that I have my fabric here. I spray it on the towel. I will generally turn it over, do another spray, and then I will hang it up on my drying rack over the door and just let it dry. And it usually dries pretty quick because I don't like dunk it or anything like that. And then when I um, often will put my towel up there also to dry and then hang on. 
I can fold this towel up. And this is just like literally a $2 towel I bought from Target. Nothing fancy. And then when I do uh, my towels for laundry, I just pull this out and throw it in so it's always nice and clean. And it fits right inside my ironing and starching caddy here. So um, this little one is a little bottle of full strength in case I ever have something um, really tiny. The smaller the pieces, pretty much for me, the um, firmer I want that fabric to be. So this is non-diluted for really small ones. If I'm doing maybe two and a half inch squares, I'm gonna use that fabric for that. Or if I'm gonna use that fabric for uh, one and a half inch squares, I will dilute that. I will spray that fabric and starch it with the full strength because I want it a little bit firmer. And I also keep one here with water. Um, I know this is my mister. Sometimes I just want a little water. So that is how I do my um, starching. And the last thing I do for ironing is I have my clappers. I love my clappers. Um, clappers help to get a little bit more flat uh, blocks. So what you do is when you iron, say this is a block, you're gonna iron your fabric like the seam, you're gonna iron the seam and you're gonna put your clapper on your seam. You wanna make sure that your iron is hot when you do that and that way your fabric is hot. Your clapper goes on it. This is unfinished wood. So it doesn't have a finish on it. So um, it's going to draw the moisture and the heat into the wood. And this is a hardwood. It's a special kind of wood. You don't wanna use pine or something that's gonna get sap out of it or that's going to warp or behave badly when it's moist. So this is a nice hard wood and you can leave it on there for some time. You can leave it on there overnight if you need. I usually just leave it on there while I'm going and working on the next block or doing something else. You can put two of them together to get a little extra weight. And then when you um, pull it off, you'll have a much flatter um, seam. It's really important um, to me for seams that intersect. So if I have multiple seams that are intersecting, I'm always going to use my uh, clapper. So what else will help with um, getting flat seams would be a wool mat. Again, it's one of those wool mat or no wool mat camps. Um, the wool mats definitely will give you a flatter, um, a flatter block. What they do is when you're ironing on a wool mat, the um, mat will absorb the heat and sort of put it back into the fabric. So it's almost like ironing from both sides at the same time. It's really kind of nice. Um, this one I haven't used yet. I have several sizes. This is like a 14 by 14, I think. Um, what else do I have? I have a small one and I have a really large one. I do have one that's exactly the size of a fat quarter so that I can iron an entire fat quarter if I need to on that wool mat. Now, the thing about wool mats that people have issues with isn't the wool mat itself. They, they work really well. It's that it's wool. It's from a, um, an animal and it can sometimes have a strong sort of uh, wool smell, especially when it's new. It almost smells like a wet dog in a way. And then the more you use it and air it out, um, the smell does kind of go away. It never fully goes away that I've, I've experienced. I've had um, the wool mats that I use frequently. I have had them for about two years, maybe a year and a half, something like that. And um, when I iron, I don't mostly notice it anymore, but if I stop to think about it, I could still smell a little bit, but it's not anything like it was when, I, when it was new. If you are sensitive to smells, there is an alternative you can get an alpaca pressing mat. So you're getting the same benefits, except for you're not getting the smell from the wool. These are more expensive. Um, in my experience on these, you're probably gonna pay uh, a third to half as much more for one of these in the same size uh, in the alpaca as you would with a wool mat. This one I keep in the bag. I've used it many times. This is one of my favorites. The one thing I do like about the alpaca versus the wool is you can set a higher setting on your iron. Um, the wool mat does say in the instructions that you should not use anything higher than a wool setting on a wool mat. Um, so that should be, I guess, I guess it's something we should all just realize. I didn't think about that, but I did read the directions, so I know that. On an alpaca pressing mat, it says in the directions, you can use a higher heat all the way up to cotton. Well, that's mostly what we're using is cotton, so you can get a little bit of higher um, heat setting um, on that. Now, I have heard people with wool mats say they use the cotton setting. I'm just saying it says in the instructions on the wool mats that you shouldn't, um, that you should use a wool setting. 
and um, that's my disclaimer on that. So I love the uh, packet pressing mat. This is my, like I said, my absolute favorite. I use this one the most. So there's your ironing spiel here. How I go about ironing and my favorite notions to use with ironing. Now, real quick, this small iron can be used with anything, um, but I don't use this small iron when I am ironing um, large pieces, like if I'm ironing backing before I drop it off at the quilters, or if I'm ironing an entire quilt top, I will pull out my full-size iron and my full-size Rowenta. So that being said, there you go. Um, this is also something that is an extra. This is a little hack that I kind of came up with. This particular container is a knitting needle container, but I use it to keep all of my small specialty rulers so that they don't get lost and everything fits in there. Now these again are rulers you don't have to have, but they're nice to have. This is an add a quarter ruler, and this is good if you are doing like um, paper piecing or something, or if you're um, folding up a foundation paper, it does have a lip on it. So you can pull the lip right up to a seam or right up to um, the edge of what you wanna cut and then cut right across the rotary area. And this little uh, lip here, is a quarter inch. So it makes it easy that you don't have to measure. It just goes right up against, butts up against the seam and it's an automatic quarter inch. So kind of handy to have. Um, it does have two different sizes. I've got a smaller and a larger one. Absolutely necessary, no. Kind of nice to have when you need it, yes. Something I use frequently, no. Um, these are also kind of nice to have. These I do use frequently. This one's pretty long. Let me pull the shorter one up. Now these are for used for use when you're making like half square triangles. So if you have a square and you need to draw a diagonal line that you're gonna sew on or cut on, um, on your square that's gonna go, if this is your square here, and you're going to put it corner to corner, catty corner, and you're gonna draw in the middle where the lines are. So that's where you're going to cut or that's where you're going to sew. Um, actually, that's not where you're gonna cut. If you're doing it from the center, let's just do this. Here's your square. Let's pretend this is a perfect square. It is not. Let's pretend. I'm going to use my longer one. I'm going to go corner and you can see it's got a nice corner point right here. So if you get this right into the corner, it'll always be right. It'll always be true. So right into the corner there and then right into the corner on the other side. Your lines in the middle should t touch the tip of the corner and should touch the tip of the corner. Can it be longer and go over that way? Do you have to use this corner? No. You can just line it up. The line in the middle to the line in the middle should always meet those corners. Um, you're going to do the center. You're going to mark the center with your pen or your chalk or whatever. If you're going to be sewing right along the center. If you um, are just going to cut and you don't need it, you're not gonna do the um, line, you're gonna draw, you're not gonna do the center line, you're gonna draw right on the outer line because this is gonna be your quarter inch seam. So you can cut along the outer line, and now you have your triangle with your included quarter inch seam. So that's pretty much how these are designed to work. I really haven't done that doing on the edge of the quarter inch yet, I just do down the middle, but when you need to have that extra quarter inch seam allowance for things, it's nice to have. So I have a couple of those and they fit in here and I don't have to worry about losing my small skinny rulers which are easy to um, get lost because I keep them in here so that's pretty handy and then they go right into a tub on, or a uh, little bin on the side do you have to have those no but they're really handy to have and so they're in my nice to have sort of group and here we come to the last of my notions um, these are my alphabeties and my wonder clips. So let's start with the wonder clips. Wonder clips are a pinning alternative. If you don't want to use pins, these are really strong. Let me get one you'll see better. Really strong little clips. These particular ones are made by Clover. They call them wonder clips. You can get aftermarket ones from Amazon. Um, but you use these, I've used these to um, clip binding. It's really hard when you've got layer upon layer upon layer upon layer and batting and all of that on the edge of your binding to get a pin in there. So if you clip it, clip the fabric together with your wonder clips and your binding, 
all along the edge. It will hold your fabric and then you can sew or put it through your sewing machine, however. You can also use wonder clips instead of pins um, when you're just making your blocks. So you decide when's a good idea to use a pin, when's a good idea to use wonder clip, when's a good idea to use nothing. They have two sizes. They actually have three sizes. I have two here. These are a mini, so they're really skinny. And these are a medium or a regular wonder clip. You can see it's much fatter. And here it is from the side. The nice thing about the Clover Wonder Clips, and I think some of the aftermarket ones too, and I don't know if you can really see this well on camera, but these ones do have little sizing indicators right on the bottom. So you can clip it into maybe an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch or whatever. So really handy to have. These are my alphabeties. They were designed by It's So Emma of the Fat Quarter Shop, and these are great. Most patterns will have, um, let me pull out a book here where I can show you, will have the um, pieces for the blocks that you need to cut out. And I don't really want to give a pattern away because that's like not cool. So let me just see if I can do it this way. So you'll see that the pattern will have a size and it will have a number over there, an alphabet. That tells you what piece in the pattern that goes to. So if you were going to make the spool, the pattern might say that the top and the bottom here are, um, are fabric piece A and this middle is fabric piece B and you sew it to two fabric piece C's. Well, so that you know what fabric pieces all of those are, you would put one of these alphabeties on there. So you know that this is P piece F or this is um, piece H or this is piece R or whatever. You, know, you can do these several ways. You can just lay them on there if you don't think they're going to move. Or what I like to do oftentimes is I will just use one of my clips, my wonder clips, and I'll just clip it onto the um, stack of fabric. So if I've cut a bunch of H's, I've got my H's all clipped and it's not going to go anywhere and all my fabric is, all my H's are stuck together. Another way that you can do that, people have modified their alphabeties in lots and lots of different ways. These ones, I've put pins on, I've glued pins on, and if you can kind of see in the side there, I've marked each section by what letters of the alphabet or numbers are in that section. So on these ones, you can see I've just taken one of my pins and glued it. I can just pin it to my pile. And so I know that this piece of fabric or the pile of fabric here are my A's and it's not going anywhere. So there are just some, some options that you can use. So have I gone through everything? Oh, thread. Now thread is another personal choice. Um, thread's important. I keep mine in a little thread box here. I do use two different brands. I use Aurafil thread and I also use Guterman thread. I've used Mettler in the past. It's just easier for me to have access to Aurafil and to Guterman. I do buy my thread when it's on sale. I've gotten them at buy one get one. I've gotten them on flash sales. Um, there is a group So Yeah Quilting online. They're in Nevada. They have a quilt shop there. And they often have um, de-stash videos. They have videos every week on fabric sales or de-stashing videos. And you can get um, these little Aurafil like color things from them sometimes on sale when they're clearancing them out or they're doing a de-stash and you've got them at a really good price. So I always look for them that way so that way they're more um, affordable to me and I don't keep a lot of colors for just regular quilting my favorite color is a color 2000 Let's see if I can get it up there that's my favorite this is my go-to it typically blends with just about everything I don't have to use different colors and constantly changing out my machine I can also keep um, you know five six bobbins constantly spooled up with this so that if I run out I don't have to unthread my machine I can just grab a new bobbin pop in a new bobbin and I keep sewing um, another color that I like if I'm doing some darker fabrics is the uh, 2600 so if I'm doing grays or blues or something where I'm really feeling like the um, 2000 might just show in a seam, I will use this. So these are my go-to colors. I do have a much darker one, which I've used for a really dark, dark navy. And this is 2620. Yeah, 2620. 
so I typically don't have boxes and boxes of these. This is my most commonly used um, color. I try to keep three or four of these. Uh, this one I got in a quilting box. So this is color 6724. I really haven't used it. Don't know if I'll use it, but um, yeah. So these are the colors I tend to keep. These ones I use the most, these ones the second, and these ones pretty rarely. So I like to have those on hand and I stock up when I get them on sale. And that way I can get them at a good economical price. Keep my budget down. I think I've covered everything. This was kind of a long video, but um, that's pretty much my spiel uh, notions and hopefully it's been interesting and hasn't bored you and if you have any comments or questions or things that you think are um, important put them in the comments section so we can all kind of check it out and we'll talk to you next time